Hello and welcome to another episode of Creation Conquest. My name is Shane Blevins and I'll be your host. You know, <clears throat> for a scientist to support the creationist theory is occupational suicide. As soon as there are many well established scientists that support creation, they're not the majority by far, but there are many of them that do. And as soon as a scientist comes out and supports creationism, he's blackballed in the community. It's not too often, <laughs> now there's plenty of evidence to back creation, but it's not too often that creationist evidence is published in scientific journals because evolutionists put a stop to it as fast as they can. But tonight I'm going to be discussing one such, one such piece of evidence that has the benefit of being published in scientific journals, peer-reviewed, and many other things, <clears throat> and is irrefuted. So, uh, what exactly is it that we're going to be talking about? Um, <clears throat> this, this evidence that we're going to talk about is very small in nature, but there are trillions of them. And it's huge to the creation cause, and it's detrimental to the theories of the Big Bang, stellar evolution, and the formation of Earth from molten rocks, the slow formation of Earth. Uh, many evolutionists have tried very hard to disprove this discovery, but they've been able to do, they have not been able to do so. The man credited with this amazing discovery is a well-decorated scientist by the name of Robert Gentry. Now let's take a look at some of the discoveries uncovered by this research. The major basement rocks of our planet, granite, <coughs> did not originate from gradual cooling of molten lava, but actually came into being in their solid present form. The fact, this fact alone completely disproves the Big Bang and every evolutionary theory of the origins of stars in our world because it's an instantaneous thing. It's not over a long period of time. Those major rock formations came into existence within a space of less than three minutes time. Incredible? Yes, but scientific evidence confirms it. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about the trillions upon trillions of radio halos that are in all granite rocks, boulders, mountains, and foundation strata of the world. Those little halos prove that those rocks came into existence in solid form within less than 180 seconds. A radio halo is a mark left around a particle of radioactive substance by the radiation coming from the particle. It can only form <clears throat> in a solid rock, in, in a solid such as a rock, since in a liquid or a molten rock the mark would dissipate and could not be, you know, could not be seen. Polonium-218 has a half-life of three minutes. Its decay is followed by two other alpha halo producers, polonium-214 and polonium-210. Each one produces a halo in granite. When sliced through the central grain, they appear to be three concentric circles. Now, there are many polonium-218, 214, and 210 halos in granite. In fact, careful specimen counts and extrapolations based on them reveal that there are trillions upon trillions of them all over in granite all over the world. The vast majority of these polonium 218, 14, and 10 radio halos have no uranium 238 halos with them. Therefore, these are primary polonium halos and not daughter products, you know, not made by uranium 238. The primary polonium 218 halos are totally independent of radioactive parents. They are original in all rock in which they are found. There is absolutely no evidence that they were caused by uranium in the central grain or by passing through uranium streams. <clears throat> or by passing uranium streams, I should say. These independent polonium-218 halos develop their half-life halo in only three minutes. In other words, they emit radiation for a very short period of time, in just a few minutes. So the radio halos had to be in those rocks when the rocks were first brought into existence. The rock in which they were found had to be solid at the time it was first brought into existence or those halos would not have formed inside it within that three minute time frame. However, all evolutionary theories say that the earth was molten for millions of years. Since polonium-218 halos are found by trillions throughout all the granite of the world, all of that granite had to originally become solid in far less than three minutes when it was first created in order for the polonium-218 halos to form properly. Now, since the granite is the basement rock forming a thick layer with the continents of the world above it and the basalt and magma below it, all this continental foundation had to be formed solid in less than three minutes' time. With this fact in mind, there's little reason to expect the magma below the continents 
<clears throat> the magma below and the, and the continents above have been formed in millions of years if the granite between them was formed in less than three minutes. For example, let's take for example this. Uh, imagine dropping an alka seltzer tablet into a, a glass of water and as the bubbles rise up. <clears throat> now imagine coming across a glass of water that's been frozen and you see half an alka seltzer tablet and the bubbles frozen in place. It would be easy to conclude that that ice froze pretty rapidly to trap the bubbles. Otherwise, the bubbles, as well as the Alka-Seltzer tablet, Alka tablet, would have dissipated. Radio halos are, are similar in that concept. It had to have all happened at a relatively fast pace of time, otherwise they would have dissipated. Now, the alpha recoil technique has proven that these isolated, independent, polonium-218 halos were definitely not caused by passing uranium or other radioactive solutions as theorized by critics of this discovery. Alpha recoil research reveals that radioactive damage trails are always left by passing radioactive solutions. These granite, the granite should not be classified with the igneous rocks, um, all of which come from molten rock, but rather as primordial or genesis rocks. Granite, generally almost white in color, is original in its present solid form and is not secondary to a prior cooling from the black basalt beneath it or from anything else. <clears throat> granite with its large crystals cannot be made from any molten rock, including molten granite. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, when we melt granite and then let it cool, it, it always reforms itself into rhyolite, never into granite. Rhyolite has smaller crystals and looks different. This is another evidence that granite was not formed from a molten rock. Polonium-218, 214, and 210 halos in granite cannot be reproduced in a laboratory. No one has provided an acceptable explanation of how independent polonium could have gotten inside those granites in the first place. It's an impossible situation, but there they are. <clears throat> Lab tests on polonium halos are often made on mica in granite. But fluorite, another large granite mineral, also has polonium halos. Unlike mica, fluorite is a totally solid mineral and polonium halos embedded within it are the same as though they were embedded in solid, thick, unflawed glass. Another strong evidence that the independent polonium halos are unique and not daughter products of uranium is the fact that the ring structures of polonium are different than those in uranium chain halos. The sunburst pattern of delicate needle fission tracks always seen in uranium radio halo chains after etching is totally missing from polonium radio halos. When, you know, when I put together these videos, I also researched the counter arguments against them, just to get an idea of what, what, what the opposite view is. <clears throat> and what I found quite amusing and typical with this topic was the, the blatant use of circular reasoning. Every argument against this hard-found scientific evidence was linked to the fact that since we know the Earth has existed for billions and years, <clears throat> this can't be true. Of course, there's no alternative, no alternative explanation for this evidence. One argument was literally so blatantly circular reasoning that it stated that because it did not support other evidence of a great age Earth, it's, it's not true. I mean, you can't get more circular than that. So in essence, they're saying that since the scientific evidence does not support our scientific theory, we're going to refuse to recognize the findings seems a bit backwards to me. All this evidence has passed peer review and was published in open scientific literature and is still, decades later, yet to be legitimately refuted. It was not until the realization that it actually contradicted the theories of evolution that it became a controversial subject. You know, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This was the first day. However, I don't believe this is when the granite or the land mass was formed because the earth was void and without form. Now, if we skip ahead to the events of the third day, we read that God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth. It's my belief that it was on this third day that all the land mass and rock strata was formed. But regardless of whether you believe it to be on the first day or the third, we can deduce from both the Bible and science a very close estimate. From the Bible, we know it had to be prior to the end of the third day because plant life was brought forth. And from science, we know it happened to happen, had to happen in a time span of less than three minutes.